This time on the Highland Woodworker. We're horsing around on this hand-carved carousel. See what happens when a crafty idea and an eager art community come full circle. Then, a quick and easy way to put a bead on any board. Popular Woodworking's Chuck Bender shows us how. Plus, meet a young, aspiring woodworker who went from helping his dad in the shop to making beautiful pieces like these. It's crazy to start a publishing company in the internet age, but you know, that's, that's what I did. He is one of the most popular woodworkers on the planet. Chris Schwartz invites us into his Kentucky home and opens up about how he got his start and how he discovers woodworking's lost art. All of these stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hi, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker. Highland Woodworking is where I come for my tools and resources. Hey, Chuck, good to see you. Hi, Ed Sin. Listen, Ed, I've been trying to make some dados and some very special chair stock, and sometimes it's even an end grain, maybe three quarters of an inch wide. Have you got something to help me? I think we do. I think we have just what we need. But first, I want to introduce you to an imaginative sculptor who ropes in an entire community of woodworkers and artists of all levels and takes them on a joyride. We're in Chattanooga, Tennessee with my friend Larry Ridge, and Larry's been horsing around. In fact, Larry builds and refurbishes carousels. Hello, Larry. How are you? Welcome to Chattanooga. Oh, it's great. Tell us about it. Well, we always like to say it's ordinary people doing extraordinary things because at our school, we'll take people with very limited woodworking experience or carving experience and be able to show them the craft of carving carousels that's been around since the late 1800s, early 1900s, and end up with a beautiful animal like this that will last another hundred years that their great-grandchildren could come and see. And so all of these animals on this carousel were built at your school. Yes, there was uh, a lot of people that were involved in them, a lot of volunteers that were involved, but the thing that we, are, we like to be proud about is that the majority of those people were amateurs who had never done it before, or ladies who just wanted to get involved in such a great project. We were able to have painters, uh, mechanical people, and, and really carvers that were able to put all of these animals together and all this beautiful artwork that you see around us here to create something that, that is a lifetime experience that people can come back and share years and years from now. So some of the horses and some of the animals are a combination of media. They're not just all woodworking. That's right. It's, uh, it's woodworking in the context of everything is carved just like traditional carvers because you have to remember the majority of these guys in the old days, the, the golden masters as they called them, were all traditionally trained in Europe. There was a lot of them that came over after working for years over there carving churches and, and synagogues and some of the other traditional carving. So that was a, an artwork or a traditional woodworking art that came from hundreds of years ago. And they transferred them now to the carousel animals because that was what they were doing at that moment in time. Let's look at one that you did. Uh, the, the next animal down here is, is a goat that I carved. It was the first carousel animal that I did uh, years ago. 1985, but uh, you can see all the different intricate of the hair and, and some of the carvings with the bells and the trappings on it. Uh, it's got some age on it now, so it's showing some wear, but obviously it uh, is held up very well. It'll be around for a hundred years or more. That's just a beauty. Well, let's go to your shop and see how you do it. shop, Larry. And on the wall here, is this the way you start? One of our students sent us a picture of a horse that he wanted to, to, to carve. So we make a full-size pattern. 
cast it up on the wall and this way we get all of our parts. You can notice how the legs are all put together showing even the dowel holes. We've got the trappings that are on the side of the body. We should have all the different uh, joints for the neck, for the head. One thing we have to be extra careful about is making sure that the grain is always going in the best direction for strength. Sure. So the body is going this way. The legs are always going in the maximum direction. You see the lines that we have. And you can also see how many pieces of wood that it takes to put one of these bodies together. So it's quite an undertaking just to get the body ready so that they can start their carving. So you go from here, this is kind of your model, to block it up. And then you go to, can you show me? Sure, let's step over here. We have an animal that's just basically started right now. And you can start seeing how we've put a lot of these pieces together. If you look right here, this is a leg that you'll see where we put all of the pieces in there. You have joints here joints here and extra pieces that we've laminated on there in order to get the thickness that we need to cut back down to make it look realistic. But there's the body. You'll notice that it's hollow as it can be. There's no way we have filler blocks in the front, excuse me, in the back and in the front and that's to put the legs in where we run the dowels. But everything else is hollow and then it's just a matter of taking away the wood that you don't need. Well, how do you glue it up? Do you use a bunch of big clamps, or what do you do? We have some clamps that we use just for the big panels that we call them, like this side piece here is two large pieces, so we'll use a standard like a, a pipe clamp, something like that to hold it together. But then when you start getting into some of these curved shapes and these odd shapes, we use pinch dogs. Show me those. Well, right here behind us, if, if you can look at this, we have a bear that we're putting together. This is a baby polar bear, and this is a pinch dog, and it's really nothing more than a metal staple. And those things are great because no matter what the shape is, if you can get two points into a piece of wood, you can hold them together. You just put them in and tap them, and the harder you tap them, the harder they're going to hold. Hey, that's great. You can put them everywhere. They're really fantastic. Here's another feature, too, that you can see. This is how the heads go on. You notice everything is doweled. We have flat stock, and you can see all the filler pieces that are in here. And so we'll run these dowels in, either three-quarter or one-inch dowels that go in. And then you mate the holes up on the other piece and put them together. Put lots of glue on it. And then just put the clamp on there and away you go. And it's going to be strong. It will be. It's amazing how strong these things are because that's a lot of massive wood right there. And with the new modern glues that we use, uh, they're tough. That's they're really wonderful. tough. Now, what about the tools? What tools do you use? to remove all this wood and to, to give it this beautiful shape. We like to be more traditional. Uh, some people will use the power tools and grind them away, but we find that if you use the right tool correctly, you won't have to use a power tool. So we like to go back to the old fashioned way of a big chisel and a big mallet. And you would be amazed the type of wood that you can remove from these things. Is that what they call a firmer chisel? Uh, that one is a firmer. Some, uh, the old days they used to call them quick gouges, as in quickly removing the wood. I can see that. Because with a big sweep like that and a big mallet, you can take off some palm-sized pieces of wood in one swipe. Well, sure. Can you make it happen? I'll be glad to. The thing most people don't realize with painting the carousel horses is that there's several, several layers of color on them, and it takes multiple layers just to get that depth of color. And what we have here is a restoration that's being done by Carol Carson, one of our painters. But you can see where she's adding layer upon layer, and she's still got about three more layers to go, but adding the little nuances of some of the uh, colors of the nose. You have the uh, black around the muzzle, some of the whites. And you do that by adding a layer upon layer upon layer until it finally looks like it's going to breathe. It gives it more depth. It does. It really does. And obviously the glass eyes that we put in them uh, is, is just a beautiful feature because it's kind of funny sometimes when you're carving them, they look back at you. And it's like they're watching you while you're carving or painting on them. My mother-in-law's glass eye does that too. <laughs> well, I can show you where you can get some different versions out of some of the catalogs that we All use. Right, that will ignite. Maybe me. she'll like to change out. Yeah, but you can see on this one, this is one that's being repaired. Uh, we're putting a new color coat of paint on it, adding some more here, and then there's trappings on the side that will be added to repair the one that we've got. We've got a nice McClellan saddle on this one because it's uh, basically a, a cavalry mount, mm -hmm. and we're putting full leather trappings on the front. These all go up here. 
for real leather trappings that we're going to put on it. About 60% of the people that come through our school have no woodworking background and, and very few of those even have any carving experience. So uh, it's amazing to see a woman who's been, uh, say, an accountant all of her life and she'll come up here and she'll start working on one of these animals and before she's done, she'll end up with a beautiful masterpiece to take home and, and put in her den for her grandkids or something. It's amazing. The carousel that we had downtown, over 60% of the people that worked on the carousel had never worked on, a, on an animal before. That was their first time. That's exciting. This has been exciting too. Thank Pleasure. you so much for introducing all of us to this brave new world here. I appreciate it and glad, glad to share something that we love. Chuck, I think we have what you need right over here. It's the dado set that we have by Forrest, the Forrest Dado King. And I think it's the blades you need to do the type of cutting you want to do. It's going to make the nice flat bottom, shouldered, and you can vary it in width to whatever you need for the project. It's got the two plates, and then in between the two plates, you're going to stack your chippers, and that'll give you the width that you need. So you can vary the width? Yep. Set the combination of the chipper widths, and you'll get just what you need. Do you think it'll work in uh, walnut and in grain? I think it'll cut it just fine. In fact, you'll be probably amazed how nicely it cuts. Uh, Force makes a great blades. They have the Woodworker 2 blade that is one of our most popular blades that we sell. That's the blade I've been using for years. Yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal blade. And so the carbide is exceptional because it comes from Forest and it's going to have great longevity. And if it does get dull to the point that you need to sharpen it, Forest will get it sharp for you and you'll have many years of use out of it. Well, that sounds great. I'm going to buy it, take it to the shop, see how it works. Okay, great. Still ahead, see how a simple block of wood and a screw scratches a lot of time off a popular project. Plus, a young woodworker went from making these for his mom to making these pieces of fine art for all of us to admire. Generation Next is coming up. You're watching the Highland Woodworker. <music> Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Order a Saw Stop professional cabinet saw from Highland Woodworking in March or April of 2014 and choose either one of these two accessories for free. That's a $199 extra value. Put a saw stop in your shop. Craig, from the first cut to the final assembly, providing woodworkers with products that help simplify woodworking challenges. Craig. Rikon Power Tools, a leader in woodworking power tools for over 10 years with a passion for quality and performance at an affordable price. Rikon has a full line of dependable tools, including a long list of industry-leading bandsaws, like their new powerful 10, 350, 14-inch professional. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Forest, manufacturer of the award-winning Woodworker II, presents the PVW blade, designed specifically for the rip and cross-cutting of plywood and plywood veneers without splintering or chip-outs. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand-cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. Highland Woodworkers are found all over the world. Email a picture of you and your woodworking project along with your name and where you live to picture at thehighlandwoodworker.com.
Want to learn an easy way to put a bead on a board? Chuck Bender shows us a unique tool anyone can make from scratch. This time on Popular Woodworking's Tips, Tricks, and Techniques. Well, Chuck Bender, I want to put a bead on a, a board uh, for a, a door, uh, you know, cabinet front, whatever. What's the best way to do it? Well, I mean, you really could use a router and a router bit mm -hmm. if you want, but here's a little tool that I've discovered throughout my years. Uh, it's called a scratch beater, and it's a really easy tool to make. Um, all you really need is a block of wood, a screw, a drill, and a file, and you can make one in your own shop, you know, really, really simply. So if you'd like, I'll show you how to make one, and then we'll sure. show you how to put that bead on there. Thank you. Just take, a, take your block, and you can either mark out the center if that's where you'd like to put it. I usually kick it a little bit off center because that way it lets me scratch that bead into some tight spaces, maybe a little deeper there. All right. And then we just take our screw and put it down into the, the block. And say you want to put about an eighth or a 3 16th inch scratch bead on a case. And so but, you can vary where yeah, the bead can, is by can, the length of the screw. Exactly, and, you can make it larger or smaller. And you can see I've got about 3 16ths or so from the face of my block to the face of my screw. Sure. Yeah. And then all I'm going to do is clamp this in the vise and file that edge of that, file the face of the screw until the edge gets sharp. Just the face of it, not the edges. Yeah, I try yeah. not to do the edges. I mean, it's quick and easy. You don't want to file away, if you're using a slotted or a Phillips head, you don't want to file that completely away. Sure, yeah. Slotted are usually what I use, and then I just usually run a hacksaw back in there to deepen the slot again. And then it's a really simple tool to use. Just drag it right along there, and you can see it puts a nice little bead on there. Now, this edge is still sharp. You'll have to ease that over with a hand plane or some sandpaper, but That's it's right. a really quick and easy way to do a scratch. And you just bead. stop short. You can go, you can, I can bring it up to the end mm -hmm. and then scratch bead across the end and bring that right into the corner. So if I was going to do a drawer front, Excellent. really easy to do. The other just thing, round it over a little bit? Yep. Yeah. The other thing I'll do is on the ones that I make for my shop, I make that outside round and that way I can move the screw around here and I can actually scratch bead curved surfaces. That's wonderful. Yeah. Makes so sense? on those, uh, lovely cabinets that I know you've made, then you can just take it and then go and right around the outside. Around. Exactly. Couldn't be more simple. Now, hardwoods, this will work on hardwoods It too? works. I've used it on mahogany, tiger maple, walnut, anything you want to do. It'll do, you may have to go back in and sharpen that screw every now and then because right. it dull, it's not hardened steel, it's just sure. a screw. So it'll, it may, you know, dull up pretty quickly, but as long as you have a file, you're good. Well, I'm headed back to the shop. We'll see you later. All right. Woodworking is a tradition passed down from one generation to the next. So we thought it would be fun to feature that new batch of woodworkers who are building amazing things all because of their passion for the craft in a brand new segment we are calling Generation Next. My name is Ian Grunner. I live in Goshen, Ohio, right outside Cincinnati. So when I was younger, I was, I was always outside building tree forts and just hanging out with my friends, building, building stuff. Then I started working with my father on the house, doing just home repair stuff. And then as he gathered more tools, my mom would ask him to make like something like this or a little cabinet here. So then I would start working with him and just going down in the, our basement, which was our shop at the time. I don't think either of us knew what we were doing. I was seven or eight at the time and I think he was just stepping into woodworking then too. I think we got a jigsaw was like our very or a scroll saw like our second tool and then I got this book it was like scroll saw patterns or something and it had a whole bunch of patterns in it and I started cutting out these these little animals that were four pieces like a circle with two ears uh, a circle with two legs and then a circle and another circle with two legs and you kind of glue those all together and make make your dog reindeer or any any kind of animal you want well after that i kind of just did just did small projects and then eventually grew in 
got, got more tools and then I decided to make my mom a new set of cabinet doors. And then I was just like square, square, square after square after square and I was like, I wonder if I could try something with curves. So then I started working my way into, working my way into curves and finding my, myself trying to challenge myself more and more and more. And then I made one, one chair, not really sculpted, but had, had some curves to it. And then I was like just flipping through magazines, looking for ideas and ideas. And then I find a picture of Sam's rocking chair. And I was like, man, I wonder if I ever could make anything like that. That's just out of this world. So I started studying it, looking at how he did his joinery. And it was just so complex, I couldn't really wrap my head around it at that time. I actually kind of stumbled into the lighting. I was talking to my sister one day on the phone, and I was like, Carly, do you need anything for your house? She's like, well, not really, but have you ever done a lamp? So I started, I was like, I could do a lamp. Then I kind of went back and looked over what kind of joinery I've done. I had to figure out how to run the wires up through the lamp. After I got all that figured out, I kind of started designing a lamp. I didn't want to do anything turned because that would just be too, not simple, but just not my style. And I, I knew I could do legs and curves with a center column. So I worked my way into these lamps that have just a center column, which is mostly hollow, and the leg, which I split in two and then routed out my channels for my wires and worked those back together and then did all my joinery to make everything go together. So I just want to like kind of blow people's socks off when they see a piece of furniture and they just can't can't stop looking at it, can't stop like feeling it, following lines on that on that piece of furniture. And I just want to make people look at it and go, "Wow, that's that's amazing. How did he how did he do that?" That we tried to preserve um, you know, the, the look and feel of the 18th century original. Master woodworker, author, and blogger Chris Schwartz takes us inside his latest projects. And later, we're heading back to my shop to put this forest dado king into action. You're watching the Highland Woodwork. <music> Masterpiece Wood Finish is a special three-part oil and wax system designed to enhance the beauty of wood. It's easy to apply, maintain, and repair. Applying several coats of the base coat, mid coat, and top coat to a prepared wood surface will create a finish that will make a craftsman smile. I helped develop Masterpiece Wood Finish, not just for your masterpiece, but mine too. Do you need wood? Then go nowhere but Bell Forest Products. Come stand in awe of our 20,000 square foot showroom that houses over 75 species of exotic wood, the largest in the Midwest. What more could you want? A knowledgeable staff? Well, come in and speak to one of these handsome young men because they know wood. They breathe wood. They eat wood. They live wood. They love wood. They are wood. So plan your adventure to Bell Forest Products, 200 East Hematite Street, downtown Ishpeming, or visit us online at bellforestproducts.com. Because we got wood. Introducing the ultimate flush trim rounder bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with a Master is presented by Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. If you've been living under a rock, you probably haven't heard of Chris Schwartz. However, for everyone else, there's a good chance you have read at least one of his thousands of blog entries or been inspired by the books he has authored or helped publish. Chris Schwartz, his story and next chapter in our moment with a master. And there's enough written on table saws and routers to supply the world for the next 10,000 years until the sun dies. 
But what there's not enough of is how, how things were done very efficiently by hand. Chris Schwarz is an author, publisher, and master craftsman who has a deep passion for hand tools. However, it took many years for this popular woodworker to really come to appreciate them. I think where it all started for me is not just in the blood, but when we moved to Arkansas, I was born in St. Louis uh, when my dad was in, in um, uh, residency, he was a doctor. And we moved, we left the city, like a lot of people did in the 70s, and moved to Arkansas. I was a little boy, about five. And my parents, so we lived in town, in a town called Fort Smith, um, and then my parents bought an 84-acre farm out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, no water, no electricity, nothing. Just 84 acres of bottomland and, and rocks. We were down there every weekend um, and building and learning to build uh, entirely with hand tools. I mean, we didn't have electricity, so it was all uh, you know, hand saw, brace and bit, um, hammer and nails, no nail guns. And uh, you know, I was, uh, I hated it. <laughs> I mean, I absolutely hated it as a kid. You know, being dragged down there every weekend for something. And, uh, you know, I was into woodworking. I mean, I really loved woodworking. And by the time I was 10, I had built my first workbench uh, with my grandfather's help. And, but I really wanted to use the table saw. I wanted to use the radial arm saw. And uh, my dad just forbade me. He's like, you can't use power tools. You have to use the hand tools. And so they gave me a hand tool kit and I worked with that. And all I wanted was the table saw. It's all I wanted was just, please let me use the table saw for this. because. Um, I think my only saw that really worked was a coping saw, and so it's really hard to cut, you know, rip eight feet with a coping saw. So, um, so I really just had no interest in handwork whatsoever. I mean, I just I, I wanted a circular saw for Christmas. I wanted a, a five mile uh, extension cord to the farm so we could use power tools. Um, and uh, went off to college, uh, you know, and the farm was still going. Uh, Dad was still working on the big house that he was building, and uh, it was really slow going. Went to college, uh, got my degree in journalism, and as soon as I got out, you know, I was back into woodworking. I was taking classes. I was building stuff on our back porch uh, when we moved to Kentucky eventually. And, um, uh, you know, just something in my head went off, and it was uh, back then in about 90, 91, 92. Uh, I, I bought a block plane from Walmart, a little blue block plane, and it worked beautifully. And you know, most people have a terrible experience with their first plane. And I, I've been, I'd used block planes before, but there was something that just like I flipped in my head that day. And, uh, and that's you know, 20 years, 23 years later, here we are. Um, it's just grown and gone crazy since then. And I've always been a reader, so that's the other thing is that um, uh, read, 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 read. You know, television doesn't really do it for me. Um, but So I read, and, and thank goodness for the internet because I could read more instead of watching cat videos. Chris is one of the most knowledgeable and hardest working people in the business. I, I don't even know what day it is of the week anymore, usually. Um, I only know because, you know, my wife goes to work and my kids go to school and I'm like, oh, it must be a weekday. Whether he is in his workshop downstairs at his Covington, Kentucky home, or banging out books and blogs upstairs, he lives and breathes woodworking. Years ago, he made a name for himself making his way up the ranks at Popular Woodworking Magazine. While working there, he launched a little side business that down the road had him making a very big decision. Uh, 2007, I started Lost Art Press uh, as a way to, uh, you know, I mean, I write so much that I had to have an outlet for stuff that they had no use for. And that happened to be really esoteric, what they saw as esoteric hand tool stuff. And so that was 2007. And after a few years, uh, you know, this little business just sort of grew with me and my partner, John Hoffman, to the point where we could support two families on it. Um, and so the, the question was, well, what to do? You know, do you uh, stay with the, the paycheck, which was a great paycheck with great people and uh, in a good work environment where I was, you know, respected and all that, or do you roll the dice again? You know, it's crazy to start a publishing company in the internet age, but you know, that's, that's what I did. In the fall of 2013, Lost Art Press pulled off the impossible after at least 20,000 man hours of research and pen to paper 
to make as perfectly as possible is the first and only English translation of Rubeau's definitive 18th century book on woodworking. There is even a deluxe edition. These are the originals. I had to buy 18th century first edition. Oh, wonderful. So this is what we were working with. And, uh, this is, <laughs> you know, this is a, I had to get a writer on my insurance for these books. But this is, this is, these are the originals. These are uh, de ascensioned from a um, library in Lyon, France. And uh, you can see uh, that we tried to preserve, um, you know, the, the look and feel of the 18th century original. And uh, these were obviously letterpress. You could feel, you know, all the letters. Mm. And like uh, when you get into the plates, they're just. You know, just stunning. Oh, you can nice. see where the copper plate, you know, was pressed into the page. I mean, it's, it's a very textual, uh, uh, you know, somewhat pornographic experience. At the time of taping, Chris was already hard at work on his upcoming book on campaign furniture. He invited us back down to his workshop to watch him work on a campaign piece already in progress. Yeah, this is, uh, this is some really nice kind of 50-year-old mahogany that I bought, and I'm uh, smoothing it up. This is going to be uh, a military officer's uh, campaign trunk for my upcoming book on campaign furniture. And, uh, you know, they would make it out of mahogany or teak uh, because uh, they were going to the tropics uh, where, um, you know, bugs or rot were a big problem. And so they would use a... Uh, weather or bug resistant wood such as teak or mahogany plus it looks beautiful it's just gorgeous to build and also getting to work with really old stock um, this mahogany is pretty much unlike the stuff you'll buy in the stores today is it air dried um you know what i do not know it's so old i i imagine it was kiln dried but it's been sitting in a warehouse uh stacked for uh 50 years, and um, um, I take a lot of effort to buy good wood. I think that's, you know, one of the essential parts of it, but um, it's the mildest, most beautiful stuff to work with ever. It stays flat. Um, there's no tension in it. There's no twist. Um, and, uh, of course, finishes up beautifully because the grain is so tight. But, uh, yeah. It's wonderful to work with wood that has no tension or, or twist. I mean, I'll almost pick up a board that is, has got a problem, uh, especially if it's tension. Yeah. And I'll, if I start cutting it and I see it's, you know, wanting to pull together, and a lot of the mahogany will do that. Oh yeah. Then I just say, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Put it aside. Put it aside, yeah. Put it for firewood or so let someone else work with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I spend a lot of time trying to find really good wood that and I think that's important for a hand tool woodworker is, you know, you need to, you need to, um, uh, you need to find stuff that will work with you instead of against you. And it's hard enough, you know, uh, trying to, to, to make the wood uh, into the shape you want it to, that it's also fighting you every step of the way. And uh, so I will spend extra money or extra time or whatever it takes to, uh, to get stock that is well behaved. His stock may be well behaved, but Chris, on the other hand, well, not too much. His unique style of blogging might make some readers blush. There's an upside and a downside to it. I mean, I get a lot of criticism for not being more serious about uh, in, my, in the way that I write. I mean, I write for an eighth grade audience. That's, I mean, when you, I was, went to journalism school, it's a trade school, uh, you learn to write for an, uh, an eighth grade audience and you do not use any $10 words. And, uh, you know, so I get criticism from the people who, are, who think they are extremely serious about research that, that I'm not serious. And uh, as you know from Roy Underhill, who also can play the rube on television, is that dude, that dude reads 18th century French, that dude knows a lot more than almost any other hardcore researcher from the time he spent at Williamsburg. And, uh, so there's a difference between taking your research seriously and uh, giving something to your audience they can use and that's uh, or that they will read you know you have to entertain uh, you do and that that sounds like you I don't know it sounds like you're not serious but if you don't keep them if you don't hook them and keep them then you've lost and that's that's all there is to it in blogs he can be himself and in books he can be 
iconic? Well, everything I do is trying to make, uh, to stop the hemorrhaging of knowledge, is that to put it back out there in a printed format in books that will uh, last uh, easily a couple hundred years, and that's all we do. We acid-free paper, sewn bindings, uh, hardcover books, so that this knowledge can be preserved uh, in hard format. I mean, so you don't have it on floppy disks or eight-track tapes uh, in a hundred years and people don't know what to do with it. Um, books are a very good way to transmit knowledge over long periods of time, like the Rosetta Stone. Um, so, you know, that's, that's my goal is, up, you know, upstairs I have a shelf that's filled with all the books we've put out through Lost Art Press. And, uh, you know, that is, that is, that's who I am. And that's who I am going forward are, are you know, the, each one of those that gets added every time we put a book out and, um, uh, and they're going to be around for a lot longer than I am. Um, you know, my furniture, I, I, you know, if you can only make 12 pieces of furniture a year as a, as an individual maker, you're not going to leave much of a mark. Um, but hopefully the mark will be, you know, in, in the hands and, um, in the minds of the people in the future who will be able to stand on other people's shoulders who did all the research. People like Don Williams with Rubeau and uh, George Walker and Jim Tolpin with My Hand and Eye so that they can take the craft where it needs to go and don't have to reinvent the wheel every generation. So that's, that's, that's what I hope I, I leave. Well, earlier in the show, Ed sent showed me a forest dado king and it looks like it's going to be the answer it's got a negative hook on all of the carbide cutters all the teeth and that's going to give me a real stout cut that should keep any wobble out of it and make it exactly what i'm looking for even in end grain uh, we've got the two outside blades and then all the cutters inside that you can stack up to go from one quarter of an inch dado up to 29 30 seconds. Well, I'm going to take it over to the saw, put it through its paces and see what it'll do. Well, I've got the forest dado king set up to do a half inch by half inch dado and some walnut stock. Let's see what it'll do. Well, it's a beautiful dado with good square shoulders, flat bottom, and no tear out. Now that is forest quality. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that does it for this episode. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.